Welcome to Sports Econ 101, the show where we discuss sports topics from a business perspective. I'm your host, Edward Brown, along with my co-host, F.P. Santangelo Jr. and Vern Glenn. Russell. I'm the middle one between the trees there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. For, uh, for the audience who uh, is just listening and not watching YouTube, there's a picture of uh, Vern who towers over um, Rick Barry and Bill Cartwright. <laughs> there's a little, little space in between you guys there, huh? Yeah, uh, I would say so. Just a bit. Okay, at each commercial break, we're going to ask a sports trivia question. And uh, too bad Russell's not here because we know he's a big NBA fan. Uh, it's going to be NBA nicknames. We'll see if you guys know your, your nicknames. Okay, yeah, that, uh, that, that'll a little, little, little head scratcher. Okay, when we come back, we've got a lot to talk about. Uh, you got opening day for Major League Baseball, uh, the potential new face of golf, maybe. Um, a little bit of Deshaun Watson. I uh, want to hear what you guys have to say about LeBron and uh, if he's going to have impact on the uh, uh, the next Lakers coach. There, there was a there was a story that uh, Bruce McGowan used to tell about, and I can't remember which player it was, where the coach had was trying to or, order people around, and uh, this one player says, "Because I'm not listening to you." And he goes, "In a week, you're going to be out of here anyway." Jeez. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's not a way, way to command respect. That, that reminds me of uh, Will Chamberlain. He was he, he was in his hotel room. There was a knock on the door just going, hey, Will, we got shoot around. And Will says, hey, I'm only going to go to the arena once today. So you can pick the shoot around or you can pick the game. <laughs> well, when you're, when you're Will Chamberlain, uh, <laughs> excuse me, you can uh, kind of command a little bit of uh, power on that. You know, do you know at one point he was one of the strongest men in the world? I believe it. That should be fun. Yeah, very, very good guy. All right, stay with us. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. Don't touch that dial. We're going to be right back. Brown here along with F.P. Santangelo Jr. and Burns Glenn. All right, guys, uh, let's start off with opening day for Major League Baseball. All right. All let's right. Who's going to win the World Series? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, well, you opening, don't day, know. opening day is it's, it's a really cool thing. I, I, I Obviously, since I work in the Bay Area and the Giants opened at home, I covered opening day. I mean, you're, you're, you're all over the place. And it was my 32nd opening day with the Giants. Wow. And it's it's the kind of day where you're at you're at the ballpark at nine o'clock in the morning, because you want to get there too early instead of too late. And then there's just a lot going on. There's a lot of pregame interviews and 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 video and content you have to shoot from from the bunting that's all over the stadium to the the MLB and Giants logo on the side of the bases as the grounds crew kind of gets everything ready. So it's a lot of pop and circumstance and then there's a lot of shows i mean fp will will tell you i mean that we we had i i I had a noon show i had a 12 30 to one o'clock show and then finally you know the game was at 135 and because it's opening day never really starts on time so it's more of a 145 start and then and then let the games begin that's the only time you really get a break and then once the game ends then you're you're on again And, and in the case of the giants it went extras. Yeah. And so I had to do my five o'clock newscast from the manager's interview room because the game's going on. So you can't get on the field. And so I had to do the same, same thing at six. By the, by then I would have gone in the clubhouse. That was kind of cool. I mean, it's been a couple of years since I've been in a giant's clubhouse following yeah. a game masked up by the way. And then you, you go out, you do your six. And then, uh, then, then I was I was on at seven. I walked out of the stadium about seven twenty that night. Well, that was a long day. And then I had to turn around and do the eleven. Yeah, well, that's you know that's that's just say hey, that's that's the life. That's opening day. I did two and a half hours worth of show production. 
for opening yep. day and then this entire weekend's been nuts. But guys, opening day is so romantic. Mm-hmm. It's my favorite day out of the year because it gives so much hope. Yeah. No matter where you are, no matter where you're projected, your team is on the same even playing field mm-hmm. as everybody else, all other 30 teams. It's just so great. It's good atmosphere. It's a leisure activity. It's a leisure sport that say baseball is. So you get to enjoy the atmosphere. And that's what I love so much. And then this weekend, we had so many great storylines. We had so many cool things happen. I mean, yesterday on Monday, we had Miguel Cabrera tied Ted Williams with the most extra base hits already out of the gate. We had all these videos of a pitcher that made a diving catch in Tampa Bay and Brett Phillips. We, we have all these quirky things happening in baseball. I mean, the Rockies beat the Dodgers to open up the series 2-1. It's crazy. It's crazy what's going on in baseball. It's so exciting. It's so fun. And you know what? I'm actually cherishing this even more because I didn't think baseball was going to have a complete season after what happened during the off season with all these discussions and negotiations going on with the collective bargaining agreement. But they came to an agreement. We have baseball. Enjoy it. It's so much fun. And I can't wait to watch what's going to happen this season. I would love to know the impressions of your dad that first time he made the parent club and was lined up, whether it was third base side, first base side, on the opening day roster. I mean, as I don't care whether you're a veteran or whether you're young coming up. I mean, that to be, to be able to do that, I would think would be a uh, something you would definitely want to check off your personal list. Well, I could tell you what he told me was he was shaking nervous. Like, he wasn't even starting in the lineup. I don't know if he ever made an opening day starting lineup. He might have a few times. But all I know is he was always shaking nervous because he knows everybody's watching that opening day game, of course. And the guys try to do stuff. They try to relax themselves any way they can for that first game. But trust me, they, like, this is the first real game that counts. Spring training, there's a couple thousand people that come out now. Maybe in the best case, it's like 10,000 people. But – it's different when there's 50,000 people and everyone's just going nuts and everyone's just so energetic and hopeful. And then you talk about the media buzz too, Vern. Mm-hmm. Like everybody's there, not just like a few people because 162 games, you know, it's hard to get a media outlets there for every single game. But the first game, oh, everyone's there. So it's cool. It's such a different, unique buzz. And I think it's just romantic and the greatest thing. Well, like you said, In that vein, you're talking about media on opening day. There are newsies that show up and do all different kinds of opening day angles. Mm-hmm. Once they work that opening day, you don't see them again until the playoffs. <laughs> it's just the, the sports guys that take over in between. So, and by the way, I had, I had a nice interview with Joey Bart before that very first game. And Bart just, it just, he just comes off like he doesn't even have a pulse, but I, I, but I asked him, I mean, what, what's it like being the guy following the guy, you know, having to catch it? He said, Hey, you know what? I'm just, I'm just riding the wave. I'm just letting it come to me. And, um, Gratitude. and he had, and he had an outstanding opening day, you know, going, going deep for the first time in his career. Yeah. He's actually fourth in NL rookie of the year odds. So look at that going forward. If you're a baseball fan, he actually might be the NL rookie of the year. And I think he's got a strong case, but there's a lot of talent out there. It's just – it's another storyline to look at. There's tons of storylines to look at this year, and it's it's so exciting and it's so fun. And, Edward, for you, the uh-huh. cool thing is on these opening days in the opening series, if you really took a look at the catcher, the the pitch comm device were on the wrist of these catchers. Yeah. They weren't old school calling the game. I mean, they, they had a little thing, and then they pressed a little button, hit a transmitter in the cap of the pitcher – the second baseman, the shortstop, and the center fielder. You're only allowed five out there in the field. And and that was uh that was pretty that was pretty cool. Although I think the transmissions went down. I know we're taping this on a Tuesday, but on a Monday night, the transmissions must have gone down at Oracle Park because they were going back to the old school signs. <laughs> oh yeah, very it's been a it's been an issue with a wrong uh, across major league baseball. So the the pitch com, what it is, like you're saying, Vern, you press the button and it'll say fastball down and away it'll say slider in and they'll actually say that in your ear and for some reason they've been just working out the kinks it's a new technology so of course but across major league baseball they've been having some issues i'm sure they'll fix it. <laughs> um is that the only thing only transmission is just those 
few, you know, fastball and that sort of thing. Oh no, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost it's in, in a male Siri type voice in your cap. What, what I mean, what I mean is, uh, you know, uh, pitch out. Uh, other, I'm just wondering if, if guys are going to somehow use this for cheating. You know what I mean? No, well, I well, the reason why they put in pitchcom was to avoid the second base runner from stealing signs. Yes. That's why they put it in. Oh, I remember that, but uh, you know, because the, the whole, uh, well, that and uh, was it the Houston Astros uh, issues that they had before. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering, is, is there a way that, I, you know, me, I did conspiracy theory. I keep thinking, okay, how are they going to use this in such a way that it, it was not intended? I'm not sure. I have to well, they'll find a way. It. Trust me. They'll find yeah. a way. If there's a way to cheat in baseball, you'll find a way to do it. <laughs> this is the first time we've really seen ever that technology is being used to really get rid of cheating. So this is very exciting. Yeah. So we'll see how it affects the game. We'll see if, you know, there's less runs scored with the runner in scoring position because of it. Uh, a lot of people, including players, say it's completely fine to steal signs from second base because you've earned that right getting to second in Major League good. Baseball. Yeah, good point. But the thing that they're really trying to protect is stealing it in a video room or relaying signs illegally through a buzzer right. or other means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that to me is really cheating versus second baseman. Hey, guys, we're going to go to our second the runner in second. Uh, second, we're going to go to our first trivia question here, NBA nicknames. What player was known as the Croatian sensation? All right. That's our uh, trivia question. Uh, and I'll give you a hint. He played in the 90s uh, is what I remember mostly. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, all right. Email edward at sportsecom101.com. The answer to this question, what NBA player was known as the Croatian sensation? All right. That's our tri- first trivia question. Uh, don't touch that dial. Sports Econ 101. We'll be right back. Sports Econ 101, Edward Brown, F.T. Santangelo Jr., and Vern Glenn here. Okay, guys, first trivia question, talking NBA uh, nicknames. What NBA player was known as the Croatian sensation? That would be former Chicago Bulls star uh, uh, Tony Kukoc. That's correct. Yeah. Very good. And, in- and the, 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 the story there is way back when Kukoc and Vladi Divac were, were really, really tight. And and the unrest happened, and the and and actually the countries split. Uh, Croatia split, and Kukoc was had his allegiance to one country, and then he had the allegiance to the other, and it really kind of caused a great divide for quite some time, until uh, a documentary was put together where where the two finally got together. Boy, then now they can just kind of teach Putin how to do that. Yeah, jeez, that's kind of crazy. Um, Going back to uh, baseball, so uh, this better placed fifty dollars on all of the quote unders um, for Major League uh, Baseball. I guess it was probably on opening day, and he won fourteen of the fifteen that he placed. Wow, he he hit fourteen of the fifteen. Fourteen of fifteen, he won two hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars on that parlay, Um, and. One of the interesting things that I'm mentioning in this article about how, you know, low scoring usually happens in the beginning of the season due to the pitchers having the upper hand, you know, kind of makes sense. Right. I mean, A, they're fresh and the uh, ball play, you know, the, the uh, hitters may not know who these pitchers are. Um, and also, like, like, I guess a lot of times guys are kind of rusty, you know, come with, uh, with the bat. But it reminds me of uh, what, when 
you know, many, many years ago, I had this theory that in like in football on the first game of the season, again, because pretty much, you know, nobody really knows who's, I mean, you have an idea of who's going to be good, right? But right. You know, who knows, right? Uh, so bet on all the underdogs taking the points, especially the ones at home, for just for the first game. Because it's kind of open season there, right? And then the other thing was, and I and they stopped doing this for whatever reason. You know, on the Kentucky Derby, sometimes there's like, you know, 22 horses running, right? Right. And what they would usually do is they take the, you know, I'll, I'll call them the lousiest 12 <laughs> or, or whatever figure. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they would call that the field. Well, if you bet on the field, you get pretty much all those horses. And if you right. bet to show, which is third place, if any one of those horses come in third, second, or first, you're, you're going to end up winning a fair amount of money. Mm-hmm. And I did that for like, I don't know, four years in a row. And I, I you won. can't do it anymore. No, you can't. I, I remember look, trying to look and they don't have the field anymore for uh-huh. whatever reason. And, and I don't know. I'm not sure if that's the reason why, but I, I just thought it's kind of neat to, to kind of look at these like you have a certain advantage at a very specific certain time, you know. First game of the season type of thing. I thought, I thought that was kind of neat. I noticed, I looked at the, the odds on opening day, and I noticed how high the over-unders were. It was like seven and a half, eight and a half runs. Mm. I was like, whoa, this is, this is a lot, especially for opening day, because maybe they, like, they got tipped that the baseballs were still juiced or something or, or something oh. was going on. But Good point. even the starting pitchers, if you looked across Major League Baseball, had a low pitch count because they're still in, quote, unquote, extended spring training mode. And that's why – because of the lockout, you know, they lost a month of spring training. They have 28-man rosters for an extended period just to keep an extra pitcher on the roster or two because they didn't really have a spring training. So that's that's extremely interesting that all these unders hit. And it was interesting to me that all the, the under-over mark was was pretty high. It was like seven and a half, eight and a half runs. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, so, somehow the A's bats didn't get the message Monday night. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Jeez. They, took, they, took and they, they went deep four times, including a granny. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, then uh, I heard that uh, the, someone was talking about how the, the Giants uh, might have the best bullpen. Because yeah, they, I mean, they, I mean, they, I mean, the, the, the pitching is there. I mean, it's, I mean, they, the band got to back together and they just picked up where they seemingly have, have left off. I mean, they were only going to get better too. Yeah, I think what you were saying earlier, uh, Edward, is you just got to look out for the bats. And the bats are still in spring training mode, too. They just got to get their timing. So all across Major League Baseball, the only lineup I saw that really hit extremely well besides the A's yesterday was the Toronto Blue Jays. And my goodness, that lineup is crazy. Mm -hmm. It is murderer's row. It's just nuts with Matt Chapman now. And then you got uh, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., and you just got everybody in that lineup just so stacked. George Springer, it's you just go through it and you're like, oh my goodness, there's no breaks. There's no breaks if you're a pitcher. Mm. So that's gonna be exciting. I love the bit in Toronto with the home run jacket. You go deep and they put like a little home run jacket on you. I think that's 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 guess that's baseball's version of the of the turnover chain. But I, 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 I thought that was pretty cool. Although it, it it still looks weird to me to see Matt Chapman in a Toronto Blue Jays uniform. It looks weird to me to see a different number 26 with the with, with the Oakland A's and a different number 28 with the Oakland A's since Matt Olson is with the Atlanta Braves. He went deep, too, recently. He did. And you know what? I'd usually say it looks weird, but these guys look like they fit in their uniforms. They really do. It's, yeah. it's, gonna, it's For us Bay Area people, it's going to take a little bit because we're so used to seeing them in that green and yellow but for me it, it looks like they're like settling in really well especially Matt Olson I mean he grew up a Braves fan that's amazing so I feel and like for, that's- and for all the hate that Oakland A's management ownership gets I mean as we tape this show A's two wins two losses and yeah. and, and that's that's the business model that they want Hey man, if they if they finish five hundred this season, oh my god, my goodness, that's for a team huge. that's projected to lose what ninety, a hundred games. Yeah, oh yeah, that's huge. huge. Well, that's a, can you imagine playing for a team where everyone just expects you to lose ninety games? Oh, you gotta have to have a chip on your shoulder. You gotta that, be like, I was hey, say, a chip on your shoulder. Yeah, 
I'm still a major league baseball prospect being called up a league kid. I don't know any better. I don't know how good I'm supposed to be. I'm just going to go out there and play hard and then good things happen. That's what you can say about the Oakland A's at least. I mean, a bunch of, bunch of young corn fed, hungry guys that way. If it's close, they're swinging. Uh huh. Reminds me of uh, the movie major league. When to the, when they're you know uh, the the ownership wants to have the yeah. lousiest team so that she can move them down to Miami. That okay. was the theory behind Ted Lasso, the soccer show. Yeah, the, the, the owner took over, got got the team from the ex husband, and just to stick it to him, she she stacked the deck by hiring an American football coach to coach her team, so they would just really go in the tank. And then, uh, hey, it didn't happen. Yeah, speaking of uh, teams in. <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw, but the Lerner family in Washington, D.C. is looking to sell the Nationals. And I thought it was interesting how they dumped all this salary right before they're trying to sell their team. They're just coming off a World Series when the value for the team is probably higher than ever. And now they're looking to sell the team after pretty much just gutting it. And for me, what I circle is one of the biggest superstars in baseball and Juan Soto that plays right field for them is coming up on a contract season in about two years and a new ownership group, and if they have enough money, would probably be willing to pay for him to stay there. Otherwise, maybe he doesn't feel like a new ownership group has any idea how to manage a baseball team, this or that, and he might end up going somewhere. So major implications there, I think, in the baseball world, especially financially, since this is Sports Econ 101. Yeah, well, let me, let me ask that. you about that. So if, if, you, if you're going to sell a team, if you start getting it and keep the – salaries low you can hand that over to a, a new owner where he's not burdened with this heavy salary to begin with right yeah and they have the money to spend too they have the cap space to spend so it's even yeah. more enticing especially okay. coming off a 2019 world series win too it's a couple of years ago now but the brand is very strong there dc sports is like it's it's very big the nationals aren't a joke anymore they're they're uh they're a brand to reckon with for sure and if you keep a Juan Soto around and you want to pay him that $450, $500 million contract, well, guess what? You're like the new uh, Steve Cohen in town, who's now the, the New York Mets owner that wants to spend all the money, that has fun, that goes, I don't care what the owners are trying to do to, to scrape by, to, to cut corners, to be cheap. I'm going to just throw all my money onto this Mets team and just take every all the free agents and make a super team. Well, Maybe there's a young uh, billionaire out there or, or a young billionaire family that wants to do the same with the Nationals and the learners are thinking, hey, we got a lot of cap space and it's a strong brand. You can you can buy your team and you can bid on it. But the bidding process is pretty interesting in baseball. You have to have all 30 owners approve after you bid on the team. And it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a country club to say. Yeah, billionaire boys club for sure. That's yeah. why my, that's why my dad used to hate the Yankees because he was a big Brooklyn Dodgers fan. And he said, "Yeah, the Yankees all they do is just go out and just spend all this money." Yeah, you know, back then there was no cap space, and yeah. uh, they just they would just buy their championships. Okay, you guys ready for our second uh, trivia question about NBA nicknames? No. Uh, here we go. Uh, you'll know this one too, Vern. And FP, yeah, you might know this one. What NBA player earned the nickname "The Answer"? Okay. You know, okay. you know, right? From my home state. Okay. Ah, okay. Um, is he from your home state? Really? Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, uh, email Edward at sportsecon101.com the answer to this trivia question about NBA nicknames. What NBA player earned the nickname The Answer? I was going to do the one, The Glove, but I, I thought, nah, let's do uh, this one instead. Well, that, 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 that's another obvious one. And then I, I figured that one would be a little too obvious. All right, stay with us. We're Econ 101. We'll be right back. Do not touch that dial. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Edward Brown, F.P. Santangelo Jr. and Bernie Glenn here. Uh, second trivia question about NBA nicknames. What NBA player earned the nickname The Answer? Is it Allen Iverson? Allen Iverson, that is cool. Ding, 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 ding. Bird, um, you said that, that, where does he come from? Uh, he's from the Virginia Beach area in the great state of Virginia. 
For some reason, I thought he was either from L.A. or from Philadelphia. I know he played for nope. Philadelphia. But... No, he played in Philadelphia. He's yeah, synonymous but... with Philadelphia. But uh, fellas from Virginia Beach before he went to Georgetown and played for John Thompson. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. For John Thompson, sure. Okay. Uh, speaking of basketball, um, so now that the L.A. Uh, Lakers coach is out, uh, LeBron says he won't have a, you know, quote, a say in, in the uh, hiring. But what do you think? Well, reports came out this morning that he'd be very uh, enthusiastic, quote unquote, if Mark Jackson were the head coach of the L.A. Lakers. And that's uh, going around the circles this morning. Uh, Pretty interesting that LeBron James would be enthusiastic about a coach selection, whatever that means. So, uh, for what do you think? I can remember when he was hired by the Warriors. At the time, Mark Jackson was the third all-time leader in assists. And, and, and just widely respected. Now, with Mark Jackson, a couple of things that you know folks are going to have to know. I mean, if you're if if you're not in his inner circle, if you had not played the game, if you don't know the game, you're pretty much out. So, uh, so and 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 so that's that's kind of how he rolls. He goes on gut instinct on 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 how he wants to coach, and he's a deeply religious man. And so uh, and and. My, 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 I guess, I guess the feedback that I was getting during his run with the Warriors, uh, sometimes I, I'm not saying he walked in with a, uh, with a black hat and a, and, and a Bible and was like, <laughs> building it. but, uh, but, but, but he, you know, but there's, there, there's a big time religious, you know, element to him. I mean, I mean nothing wrong with that. Um, but, uh, but some people felt like he, he was, he, he was enforcing it a little, a little too thick. How's but, that but, that, that, but that's got nothing. That's got nothing to do with his X's and O's. So I think. Um, <laughs> how's like, that going to work with, with in LA, where you know it's almost like Sin City? You know. Oh yeah. yeah well, I mean, I, 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 I would imagine hey, winning. Winning takes care of everything. So, so as long as you win, hey, they, they, then you're okay. What What do you think the problem was with? Uh, him and the Warriors, because as soon as Steve Kerr came in, I mean, obviously, you know, it's going to be something to do with the players, you know, adding rosters and stuff like that. Uh, but the, when Jackson first came on, didn't they had a, a, a good core already? They had Curry and Thompson already. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was a pretty good core. I, I, I think he I, I think he fell out of favor with Joe Lacob. And, you know, once you fall out of favor with the owner, then the writing's on the wall. And then the owner saw Steve Kerr, a basketball savant, and, uh, and, and, and took a chance on him, and the rest is history. Well, I wonder if there's a little bit of a chip on uh, Jackson's shoulder for that. I bet you there is. You yes. never get him to admit it because he's got to do their games. But, sure. uh, but, but I, 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 I'm sure there is. And when they won the 2015 championship, they did, they did give, give some love to Mark Jackson because – yeah. He did have that core group before Kerr went in and uh, and, and and won the thing. Kind of like kind of like John Gruden coming into Tampa and, yeah. uh, and 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 taking that core that was there and then winning the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Wow. Uh, guys, I'm moving over, to, uh, the Washington Commanders allegedly withheld ticket revenue from the NFL, uh, and they apparently there's a con- con- congressional committee. Receiving this envoy, why is Congress involved in something that seems to be kind of a civil thing? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, billionaires lost a lot of money, and anytime you you mess with billionaires, they're going to use their powerful connections to make sure that this doesn't happen again. So there's a shared revenue amongst teams that run uh, home ticket sales to make things more fair, so that way everyone's getting a slice of the pie. Mm-hmm. It appears that the Washington Commanders at the time, the football team, and before that, the R words, as I like to refer to them, <laughs> were uh, withholding ticket sale revenue and uh, kind of cooking their own books. So that's that's very illegal to begin with. And if you have an agreement and you've signed a paper and it's gone through court, you know, and it says here in the contract that, and you breach that contract, you're going to have to be owing some people some money. And the one thing that we know in this business working in sports is you do not want to screw over billionaires. They will make no. your life hell. So, so he, 
so the, 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 that organization did that. And uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of this come out. And I think this might play over a long period of time, unfortunately. But, but I don't wonder how many other ownership groups are saying to themselves, Whew, good thing they're going after them. Yeah. They're going after us. Because I, I can't, I, I, not a bunch of Boy Scouts in that league or in any ownership league by just, just, just my opinion. So again, my, my point though is, what does Congress have to do with this? It's, it's just a civil thing that should hand, handle itself out in the courts. I, and I understand, I understand FD, you said about your connections, but it's like, you know, the average person's going to say, uh, you know what, we should be thinking about like inflation and the border uh-huh. and all these other domestic stuff. What, what does this have to do with why Congress? We That's what we're missing without our lawyer, Mr. Yeah. Jackman, being part yeah. of it. Exactly. And maybe there's a scale of money being embezzled or something that is throws it to those kinds of courts. But uh, it's the same thing with uh, Major League Baseball in the Congress with the steroid era and the steroid scandal. Good point. The Mitchell report. That was pretty much ridiculous, too. Yeah. Pretty yeah, much. Pretty, pretty, that's, yeah, that's that's. Uh, but again, almost even worse, you know, <laughs> but again, you have those connections. Uh, a lot of these billionaires fund these politicians. Yeah. It's, it's just how it is. Yeah. It's how it goes. And, and they, they call a favor and they're like, Hey, I'm, I'm losing some money. What's going on here. But Vern, you make a really great, great point. Uh, billionaires aren't billionaires for no reason. And they know how to get around the rules. They do. And yeah. uh, I wonder if other teams are doing the exact same thing. Oh yeah. They're now going to be looking at their books and uh, kind of probably trying to straighten them out. Mm-hmm. Hey guys, we just found an people. extra $2 million that we owe everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, moving on to uh, to golf. So, uh, hey, what about Scotty Scheffler? Do you think he's like the new face of golf? The guy's just been on a tear the last. Well, he like, certainly has shown it in the year twenty twenty two. I mean, he is just uh, I don't want to say come out of nowhere, but winning four out of your last six starts, including the Masters now, and you and you and you're not ever since he wrestled away the the, the match play against John. Uh, 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 against Thomas, he has just been on a tear, and now he's he's 25. He's number one in the world. He's uh, you know he, the, the the great storybook. He you know, married his high school sweetheart from a from a very famous Dallas based high school that's produced uh, you know Clayton Kershaw and and just just a number of dignitary alums. So uh, he's uh, he is. Uh, he is America's darling in, in the world of golf, but make no mistake. Tiger Woods playing all four rounds, walking mm-hmm. 72 holes. Yeah. And yeah, the gas ran out on Saturday and Sunday, but Tiger Woods doesn't just move the needle. He is the yeah. needle and he showed it over the weekend in Augusta, Georgia. Absolutely. I mean, my goodness, I, I've never woken up ever to see a, a tea time at 7.35 a.m., I mm-hmm. didn't watch Tiger Woods because yeah. I, I, I wanted to feel those goosebumps of yeah. Tiger Woods teeing off at Augusta. And my goodness, it was worth every single, uh, I guess, I that sleep. I had waking up. <laughs> when he so, fired that opening round, 171 on Thursday, I was like, oh. holy expert. What, the, what, what, what is this? And then he, you know, he, yeah, he had the noticeable lamp, whatever, but maybe fairways and greens for Tiger – and then when it looked like thing, everything was against him on Friday, scrambles with a 74, makes the cut in, 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 in a field and undetermined conditions that, that really don't do it justice watching on TV. That is one of the most hilly, unable to find a flat lie layouts that, that there is. And I just thought it was... I just thought it was a modern miracle that he was able to make the cut, let alone play the whole weekend. He could have easily just made the cut and just say, hey, I made the cut. Let me go to my Gulfstream jet and head back to, to, to Florida. But no, no, he, he grinded it out. His putter did fail him. And, I, and I'm, I'm sure his injury had a lot to do with it sure. because he's, he's got those steel rods and screws still in that ankle that, 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 that just won't – I mean, you can't even move that ankle. So – um the ice baths and the treatment and, and, and everything they needed to do to get him out there in the course. I mean, it, it worked and he captured the imagination of America. That's, that's, that's one of the biggest stories in sports. 
yeah. you know, doing what he did. Yeah, even though he, he didn't do too well those last two days, like you're saying, Vern, the fact that he just finished is incredible. You go from almost losing your leg yeah. to finishing all those rounds at Augusta. It's just – it's inspiring. And he's – he's the cool factor of Tiger Woods, I don't think, may not be ever reached again. Because we talk about Scotty Scheffler, and he even admits himself in interviews, he's 25 going on 40. And mm-hmm. he's very settled down. You know, he married his high school sweetheart. He's kind of bland. And yeah, that, that plays in that sport a little bit because, you know, a lot of people that play golf are, are bland. But there's a lot of people that play golf now, especially after the pandemic, that really like the cool and the swagger and all this stuff and the style and the other things of golf. And we saw Augusta try to open up with that a little bit. They had like Dude Perfect on there, which was like a huge thing that really riled up the golf community. Dude mm-hmm. Perfect is like this, uh, they're like a stunt group. They do all these crazy trick shots. Sure. But it's like, um, it's interesting. It's interesting time in golf because you have Tiger Woods, one of the coolest cats, one of the icons, kind of really gearing it down. You know, this might be uh, his last little run here. Then you have Scotty Scheffler, who's this buttoned up, kind of whatever, like yeah. uh, not, not too exciting, very like, you know, cold as ice in his blood, and he's really great at golf. But will that move the needle? I don't know. And that's kind of like the producer in me thinking about this. Yeah, it sort of, sort of reminds me when uh, Earl Anthony we used to bowl, you know, when he came out, he, he just the most boring robotic, but the guy was just, he was just a machine, you know, but yeah. no personality, but just kept winning, you know, and uh, you just don't want to hang your hat on, 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 on the face of that for your sport. Yeah. Well, yeah. Tiger had the swagger. He had the fist pump. And uh, it, he, even, even before, Stan, I mean, he he was winning those U.S. amateurs back to back, and then he yeah. he, uh, he he just made it mainstream. He says it himself. You know, when he when he first started, nobody was in the gym, just a bunch of you know pot bellied <laughs> golfers on tour that would light a cigarette, flick it, and then uh, and then tee it up and hit it. So that, but uh, <laughs> but he 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 changed the game. He did. He just changed the game. Now everybody's got a they got a swing coach. They got a they got a strength coach. They got a nutritionist. They got I mean they I mean he just he just changed it for everybody and he and and although he was very corporate and played close to the vest, for some reason he was relatable for people out here that looked like him, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and and just made it and just and just made it mainstream and he won. Yeah. Yep. And he won. What by 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 large margins and 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 just backed it up. He and Jack Nichols are the only ones who have won the Masters back-to-back years. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Hey, guys, we're going to get to our last commercial break here. Uh, NBA nicknames. Mighty Mouse was the name of what player? Mm. That was his nickname, all right? Mm. Stay with us. Sports Econ 101 will be right back with some closing comments. Last time for today, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with F.P. Santangelo Jr. and Vern Glenn. All right, guys, uh, last trivia question. Mighty Mouse was the nickname of what NBA player? I believe he is still the head coach at the University of Pacific in Stockton. Is is, is it Damon Stoudemire? It is Damon Stoudemire. Yeah. Very good. You got all three uh, questions. Plus uh, uh, the one that I didn't answer, uh, who was the glove? Well, it's Gary Payton. Gary Payton, yeah. Who, who, who is who is YG Young Glove? <laughs> it must be Gary Payton Jr. Gary, Gary Payton the second, yeah. <laughs> like that song, Young Glove. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's where that comes from. All right. Uh, just before we cut out here, Damon, uh, Damon, uh, Deshaun Watson. Uh, so his trial looks like it's getting pushed to twenty twenty three. And his base salary in 2023 is $46 million. Yep. Every game suspension will cost him, if he gets suspended, $2.7 million. 
Wow. So what are they trying to do? Just push this thing out as far as possible? It sounds like they just they just they're just kicking the can down the road, aren't they? Yeah, yeah that is what it sounds like. Okay, guys, you ready for our uh, uh, thoughts for the day? Go. There you go. Okay, how do you kill a circus? You go for the juggler. <laughs> that's a good one that's a good, that's one. A good one all right and uh i used to have a fear of hurdles but i got over it ah, very good very <laughs> you like, you like those? Just, just all right just you're wrong gonna... dad jokes right there there you go all right guys tune in next week hopefully i'll get rid of this uh stupid head cold thing okay tune in next week to sports econ 101 we're going to be discussing sports topics from a business perspective and asking more sports trivia questions. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm your host, Edward Brown. We'll see you next on week. Be, on behalf of Rick Barry and uh, yeah, Bill Carr, right? And, and, and my, tall, my, my tall friends at Good Night America. <laughs> All right. So long.